Good morning, Strong Tower. Good morning. How we doing this morning? All right, I'm glad you all are here. My name is John Thomas. I lead the youth group here at Strong Tower. And if you are a guest today, we want to welcome you. We're glad you could be here to worship with us. And we'd love for you to fill out that connection card when you get a chance. But in the meantime, please stand. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm 20, verses 1 through 8. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your salvation and in the name of our God, set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are God. You are God that protects us. God, your word says that the watchmen will watch in vain if you are not watching, if you are not our security. God, we thank God that you are our protector. We don't have to rely on any political at persons or uh, people. We don't have to rely on our military. We know that you have put those in place and we thank you for that. But our trust, our hope is on you. God, we are so thankful that you care about us. Lord, you know our hearts, you know our desires, you know where we have fallen short. God, we lift up those things to you. We call to you those areas that we fall short. We call to you where we have offended you, where we have sinned. God, we want to confess that this morning. We thank you for hearing us. Amen. After considering God and confessing our sins, we are reminded in Scripture that grace flows freely to, do, to, do, to those with faith in Jesus Christ. Hear our assurance of grace this morning. 1 John 1, 4 through 7. And we are writing these things so that our joy be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you. That God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, he is in the light. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Would you all remain standing and worship with us this morning?
we thank you that we can put our trust in you. God, that even as we sing that, God, I pray that you would remind us of the times that you've been faithful, that you've given us reason to trust. God, and for those of us who are in this space now, God, where these songs are hard to sing, where it's hard to trust. God, I pray that our voices as they ring out in the space would be a reminder. God, because even if I'm not experience, experiencing, God, what I think I should be right now, where I want to be, God, I got people in this room who have. God, that as we sing, I pray that our testimony would raise up faith. God, to trust you more. God, that you would teach us, God, to trust you more.
Father God, you are the eternal God. You exist from everlasting to everlasting. God, we thank you for that. You have created us. You have made us. Lord, will you continue to make us to be people to, to honor you, to bring you glory? Thank you, God, for your love. Lord, your love is so strong, so sound that we can build our life on it. God, thank you for the security of your love. Lord, we need you today. Lord, you know what's going, what we're going to face this week. You know what plans you have for us this week. Things that we may not be aware of. But God, we want to entrust that to you. We want to say thank you for being the one who is in full, total, and complete control. Lord, we want to lift up the African-American ministries that's uh, here in our denomination. Lord, we lift that ministry up before you as they seek to find leaders within our own communities. Would you send them? Would you bring them to us? Lord, will you continue to build bridges so that we can further the cause of this ministry? God, we thank you for your blessings and how you have established this ministry. We just ask, God, that you continue to do that. And we say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We have our confession of faith. It's just an expression of faith and solidarity with God's people. And we, we use it, or we, do, we confess our faith using a tool called the New City Catechism. I'll read the question, to, and you all will respond together reading the answer. Question eight. What is the law of God stated in the Ten Commandments? You shall not other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven or above, earth beneath, or the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not covet. Amen. You all may be seated. If you are a guest with us today, we would love for you to fill out that connect card. It's a way that we could connect with you and, and see how we can be a blessing to you. Also, we want to get you plugged into community here at Strong Tower. So if you get a chance, please fill, that, fill out that Connect card. On the flip side of that Connect card is a place for prayer. If there's anything that you're going to God about, we want to go to him on your behalf. We want to pray with you. The only prayer that scripture speaks about is prayer that has powerful impact. So we want to pray and have God work in your life and just be praying on your behalf. So if you have anything you're going to God about, pray. Uh, put that prayer request on the flip side of that connect card. In the way of um, giving this morning, 
I want you to look up here. You'll see that there are various ways to give. You can give online at strongtower.org slash give. You could text your giving in. You can mail it to the P.O. box. And if you are in the house today, you can just drop it in the giving box that's right in the back of the sanctuary. And every week, we want to encourage you with scripture about giving. So this week, we read in Matthew 6, verses 1 through 4. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do. As the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others truly. I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Let us pray. Father God, all that we have is yours. So when we give to you, when we give for your cause, we're only giving what already belongs to you. Father, will you use it? Will you cause it to multiply? Will you cause it to meet every single need? Every single need that is what your ministries need. You know them. So, Father, we pray that when we give, you're able to multiply it so that it goes to the furthest and the complete use of what your ministries need. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we have three announcements this morning. We have new members class. If you're inter interested in learning um, more about being a member here at Strong Tower, you can sign up. We would love for you to sign up. That way we know how many people to pre prepare for. But this class will be following the service on February the 25th. Lunch and child care will be provided. Again, if you want to learn more about being a member here at Strong Tower, we want you to sign up and attend new members class. You can find the sign-up information on our website, strongtower.org, and just go to the events page. Uh, our second announcement is Serve Day. Serve Day right here at Parker Street. So join us in serving our community here with Parker Street Ministries and wear your Strong Tower shirt. Again, you can sign up for this on, at strongtower.org on our event page. All right. Our third announcement is about Easter. Y'all know Easter is only a few weeks away. That'll be March 31st. And we are having two services so that we can... Uh, accommodate everybody. We want to care and love um, our people well. So we'll be having two services and we're going to need a lot of help to make these services happen. So if you're interested in serving, you can come to one service and serve in the other. Pick the one you want to come to and then serve in the one that uh, follows that or comes before that. And you can also sign up for this as well at strongtower.org, going to our event page, okay? All right, right next door is our kids' ministry. That is for infants to fifth grade. All of our students, infants to fifth grade, they will be taught over there about Jesus Christ and a safe and engaging environment. So all of our students, you all are dismissed. Everyone else, stand to your feet and continue worshiping with us.
is my faithful Father calling me out of the dark. Night cannot whisper away what he said in the night. He is my firm foundation. My ankle won't be moved. Storms may collide, but my soul is on fire. faithful father he is my faithful calling me out calling me out of the dark night cannot whisper away what he said in the light he is my firm and he is my firm So is on fire with this world. Jesus 
to feed in the darkness. He has never lost a battle. fun of me earlier because I like that song so much but it's so good it's so good it's a, we have a good God he's never lost a battle Amen. we're going to be in 2nd Samuel chapter 12 this morning if you want to grab your Bibles um, or if you want to follow on the screen or, or use your phone or whatever form you want to to read the scriptures with us 2nd Samuel chapter 12 Verses 1 through 14, as you turn there, I uh, just want to continue to encourage you uh, to get connected. If you're new around here, uh, it's hard for us to connect with you if we don't know how to reach you. And so if you could fill out that connect card, that'd be a great way for us to reach you, see how we could be a blessing in your life. Uh, we'd love to pray for you. Uh, so please, uh, please fill out that card so we can find a way to bless your life. Second uh, Samuel chapter 12, we're going to read verses 1 through 14, okay? 1 through 14, and then we'll chop it up together. Hear the reading of God's word. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. And he used to eat his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock, uh, one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, "As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die." And he said, Restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he has had no pity. Nathan said to, the, Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and delivered you out of the hand of Saul and gave, your master's house, gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. This is the word of the Lord. I want to tag our text today, Oh, happy sin. Oh, happy sin. Let's pray before we dive in. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that in your word we find that there is joy that can be restored through confessing our sins to you. Lord, thank you that in your word we can confess our sins and know there is a God eager to forgive, eager to restore, eager to change us and transform us forever. And so, God, we pray that as we look at your word today, you would call us to yourself. May we hear that calling and that invitation to find joy in you. We pray in Christ's name for his glory and our good. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Twenty thousand times per day. That's how many 
breaths you and I breathe in on average. The average person, get this, 20,000 times per day. Inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. Over and over and over. So many times, I mean, most of the time you're breathing, you're not conscious of your breathing. You don't even realize it's happening. But over 20,000 times in a day, you are breathing in and you're breathing out. I mean, isn't that incredible? I was reading this week about uh, alveoli. Have you ever heard of those? They're these little tiny pockets inside of your lungs. Now, I'm not sure how everything works, but what I was reading was that there are these little tiny pockets in your lungs that actually take in the oxygen and then release the carbon dioxide from your body. And so it's kind of the meeting point in your body where the oxygen is exchanged for carbon dioxide with your blood. And, and it's this place where this incredibly essential exchange happens. But get this. There's 600 million of them in your lungs. 600 million of them in your lungs, taking oxygen in and releasing carbon dioxide out of your body. Incredible. Now, here's the thing that I learned about alveoli. The, the, the truth about them is they can only receive in what they've exhaled out. In other words, they can only take in the amount of oxygen that there's room because they've released the carbon dioxide out of your body. In other words, what we need in our body to survive, to live, for, for our lungs to function is for us to both inhale and exhale. Now, confession, this is what I want you to get, confession is the exhaling. Now, in our culture today, there's an aversion, there's a fear, there's a, uh, even a drudgery to talking about confession of sin. I mean, let's be honest. We, we live in a world where we can't even agree on what is sin. So if we can't even agree on what is a sin, how are we going to agree on what should be then confessed? And so what's happened is now we just don't even talk about sin. We don't talk about confessing our sins. We pretend like they don't exist. And so we would much rather talk about, you know, positive energy or good vibes or I, I just want to be in a positive environment, an encouraging environment. I want something that's life-giving to me. And I'm not just talking about outside the church, right? This is inside the church where we, we are a lot of times centered on what I would call kind of a happy Christianity. I mean, everybody's smiling. You look at the Instagram, you scroll through. Everyone looks like church is amazing. And then the, the sermons are positive and happy. The, the music's joyful and happy. And, and everyone's just talking about all the great things that happened that week. And, and you show up, and if you're not smiling, you just kind of feel out of place. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being happy, right? There's something wrong with being joyful. But all the time? All the time? I mean, that kind of Christianity takes out of the gospel room for things like sadness or sin or grief or loss or all these moments in our life that really make up a large portion of our lives. And now we've relegated them to the side and said the gospel has nothing to do with that. If you're not happy and wealthy and, and joyful, you might as well go somewhere else because this is a place for happy people. We, in other words, we only want to inhale the good. We want nothing to do with exhaling bad. But what we need is both. What we need is both. We, we need to inhale the goodness of God, and we exhale the wickedness in our life. And this is, this is the surprising, life-giving joy of confession. Now, some of you are like, what, what does that last sentence even mean? The joy of confession? How can it be joyful? How can I find goodness and life out of talking about my failures? How can I find joy about acknowledging my shortcomings and my sin and, and, and all the areas of my life that are full of weakness and brokenness? How, how can that bring me joy? Well, remember, you need both. If you're going to inhale the goodness of God, you have to exhale the wickedness of your heart. You have to make room for it. You have to make room for God coming into your life to do what only he can do. And so there's freedom and gladness and joy that comes out of that. But it's just like breathing. It's this ongoing daily process where you confess and you believe. You confess, you believe. You confess, you believe. You confess, you believe. You should be doing it so often that it's almost unconscious. 
In fact, the great reformer Martin Luther, he said famously in his 95 Theses, he said, all of the Christian life is repentance. It's breathing. Confessing, believing. Confessing, believing. And so that's what I want to look at today. We're continuing this series through the book of 2 Samuel. And last week, if you were here, we, we kind of left David in the pit. We left David at the lowest moment in his life. And if you remember the story of David and Bathsheba, David is trying to play God. David is trying to take his life into control. And, and his power as king has now gone to his head. And he realizes, I've got control over people, or at least I think I do. And so he starts sending people there and there and there and there. And, and he's trying to control everything around his environment. And then he comes in contact with this woman Bathsheba, and he tries to take control of her. And so he sleeps with her, she gets pregnant, and he tries to cover it up. He tries to take control and cover it up by killing her husband, Uriah. And at that point, I mean, if the story just ended, it would be a sad story of sin. But if you remember last week, God steps into that brokenness. God says, you've been trying to send and do and, and make and, and achieve, and now I'm going to send my prophet Nathan. And God confronts David's sin so that he could set David free of his sin. That that's what we're about to see. God is saying, I love you so much, I don't want to leave you in a place where you're, you're stuck and you can't breathe. I want you to breathe again. I want you to be able to confess your sin so that you can breathe in my goodness. And so how does that work? How does this look in our lives? How, how does God bring true joy and freedom through our confession of sin? This is what I want to look at today. And so how does honest confession of sin bring the true freedom from sin? Well, first, we got to learn some things about sin. And so the first thing I want us to look at is angry sin, angry sin. So if you're taking notes, this is the first point, angry sin. Look at verse 1 as the story begins. It says this, And the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. Now, Nathan is a, uh, he's an artful and clever preacher. You, you watch this and, and, and you realize David has no clue he's listening to a sermon. David is, is listening to what he thinks is a report from Nathan about some situation out in his kingdom. And he has no idea because there's no pulpit, there's no pew. He doesn't realize what he's listening to is a sermon. And so Nathan goes into the sermon starting with a story and he says, here you go. You got a rich man, you got a poor man. And the rich man has flocks and flocks of, uh, that, that he owns. And, and the poor man has just one little lamb. One little lamb that he loved so much and he cared for so much that it was like a daughter to him. And when the rich man was going to host a meal for a guest, instead of taking one of the lambs from his abundance of flocks, he decides he's going to steal or take one of this poor man's, his, his only lamb. And as, as Nathan is getting through the story, with every word, David's blood pressure is just rising. David is getting angry. He's frustrated. He's like, how could that happen? And then David finally erupts in the middle of the story in verse 5. This is what it says. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Now, I love Eugene Peterson's comment here. He says this. He said, David's listening to his pastor preach a sermon about someone else and getting all worked up about someone else's sin. Whoa. You ever done that before? Oh, this, this, this is what my husband needs to hear right now. If my teenager could just hear this sermon, you know, if, if that political opportunist person that I'm watching on TV, if they could just hear this sermon, right? You, he's, he's listening to this sermon and he's thinking, yeah, get him, Nathan. I can't believe this guy would do that. I can't believe he would take advantage of that poor man and take his only lamb. How could he be so greedy? How could he be so hateful? Dave, or Nathan is an artful preacher. He's backing David into a corner with his own sin. 
and David has no idea. And then Nathan drops the punchline in verse 7. He says famously, you are the man. You are the man. David, this story is about you. This story isn't about someone else. You are the man. You are the, the woman. You are the person, right? God's word comes to you personally. It's not primarily for someone else and their sin. This word is for you and your sin. It's for you. But one of the deceptive things about sin is often we can't tell it's for us. We can't see it like other people can see it, right? Other people, they can see it. Just ask your spouse, ask your best friend, ask your coworkers. They see your sin better than you see your sin often, right? Ask them. They see it. They feel it. They hear it. They're around you. But for some reason, sin is so deceptive, it convinces us the real problem is someone else out there. The real problem is someone else who's wronging someone else. The real problem is someone else who's doing something they shouldn't be doing, believing something they shouldn't believe, doing something they shouldn't do. The real problem is someone else right there. But yet, our self-righteous anger will give us away. Our self-righteous anger will give us away every time. In fact, anger, anger often gives us a window into our hearts. Let me ask you real quick. What makes you angry? What makes you angry? I mean, we live in an age that, that some have called the age of outrage. The age of outrage. In other words, we stay angry. We're just angry all the time. We're, we're angry that someone's driving too slow. Then we get angry we're, that someone's driving too fast. Then we get angry that so-and-so said something to us. And then we get angry that someone didn't say something to us. We get angry at someone on TV. We get angry at someone at our job. We get angry about big things. We get angry about small things. We just stay angry all the time. Here's the problem. Here, here's the irony of anger. Often what angers us uh, about someone else is what angers God about us. And we don't even know. We don't even know. We're, we're so convinced that the other people are the problem that we don't even see the problem in ourselves. But our anger shows it. And so let me ask you in your anger, maybe, maybe you need to pause, take a look at what might be happening in my heart that is just like the person or the problem that I'm angry about. What, what might it be revealing about what's really in me? See, I think, I think we, are, we are quick to call our own anger righteous and, and to, to be slow to confess it as self-righteous. And let me tell you, there is such a thing as righteous anger, right? Anger in itself is not sinful. God gets angry. Jesus gets angry. Ephesians chapter 4 says, be angry and do not sin. In other words, you can be angry and not sin. But what it's saying is, you know, that there, it is good and right for us to be angry about injustice. It's good and right for us to be angry about sin. But what I find interesting is we almost always label someone else's anger as unrighteous and ours as righteous. Somehow we, we give us the benefit of the doubt and someone else's anger is always wrong. But here we need to pause. We need to pause and just invite, invite ourselves to say, what is my anger saying about me? What, what is beneath that? You know, some people call anger a, a cap emotion. In other words, there's things under it. It's just a, it's a cap that seals off what's really happening. And, and so underneath our anger, there, there are things for you and I to see. There's things for us to say, maybe I'm the man. Maybe I'm the person. Maybe, maybe it's me that is in this situation. And let me tell you, self-righteous people, we are grumpy people. And I know, I know from my own experience, with my own self-righteousness, we can be the most grumpy people. I mean, nothing is up to our standards. N nothing is right enough. Nothing is good enough. Nothing is kind enough. Nothing is, is perfect enough. Everyone else we look out at, and, and there's some problem we can find. There's something that's upsetting us. It's, it's because, and it, it, this is what's ironic to me. Self-righteousness seems like it would make you happy because you, you've convinced yourself that you're better than everybody else, right? But it turns out it's not that great. In fact, it turns out that not seeing your own sin 
actually makes you pretty miserable. It's very counterintuitive. You think it's going to make you feel better about yourself by convincing yourself you're better than everybody else, but what happens is you turn into a judgmental jerk, and you're miserable. Listen, ask yourself, where am I doing the same thing or worse or worse? And God begins to work on your heart, and he invites you into this thing we call confession so that blinded to our sin, we don't see our Savior, but when we see our sin, there's joy in that. So how do we deal with this angry sin? How do we deal with our hearts that are coming out? Let's look next at happy sin. Happy sin. Look look at me in verse 7. This is great. Nathan said to David in verse 7, Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. Now, we've seen David's heart, right? We've seen how angry he is, and and now God is going to share his heart. We've seen in David a a self-righteous anger, and now we're going to see in God a righteous anger. And so ask yourself, what what makes God angry? What makes him angry? Well, here it is. He, He tells David... He says, look, I have anointed you king. I've I've given you everything you have. I've been kind to you. I've taken care of you. I've even protected you when King Saul was trying to kill you. And if none of that was enough, I would have added to that more than you could imagine. I have the abundance of all resources. I could have given you anything. And yet it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough for you, David. In other words, what he's saying to David is, underneath that grumpy self-righteousness is ingratitude. It's ingratitude. And God says in verse 9, look at what he says. He says, why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? Listen, sin is personal. It's always personal, but it's also personal for God. I mean, he says it again in verse 10, in case David missed it, because you have despised me. Could you imagine hearing God say that? David, you've despised me. I mean, I think in the narrative, this is where it really cuts to David's heart. David knows because he loves the Lord. He said, there's something wrong here. I have despised the Lord. And it cuts David so deeply. It moves him to confession in verse 13. Look at what he says. David says to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan says to David, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. I mean, his confession is simple yet profound. In fact, in the Hebrew text, it's only two words, sin and Lord. You can just imagine David in the moment. He's probably overwhelmed with emotion and brokenness, his contrite spirit. He just can't even get the words out. All he can get out is two words, sin and the Lord. And that's enough. That's enough. In fact, later on, he would go on to write Psalm 51, which is his famous confession coming out of this situation. And it's much longer than two words. But in that confession in Psalm 51, where he's pouring out his heart with more words, David says this. He says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. See, what David realized in that moment is this was my path to joy again. This was my path to life again. This was my path out of the pit, is to confess my sin. Or to put it another way, joy comes when we confess, not conceal. Now, this is where the title of the sermon comes from. There's a Latin phrase I learned this week, and this is probably the only Latin I know, so I'm not trying to show off. Felix culpa. Felix culpa. I think I'm saying it right, but it's attributed to St. Augustine. And here's the translation. Oh, happy sin. Oh, happy sin. And St. Augustine, this this 5th century bishop from North Africa, he would often talk about how how, how it was important for him to see his sin because recognizing his sin is what moved him to respond to the God who saved him from his sin. In fact, he said it this way. He said, this is so important to me that when he was dying, when he was dying, he's on his deathbed, this was his request. I want everybody to take the seven uh, penitential psalms or, or repentance psalms, and I want you to inscribe them on the walls of my room. Right? He's on his deathbed, and he wants them to, to write these psalms of confession all across his room. Why? So that he can look to the left and see his sin. He can look to the right. He can see his sin. He looks straight ahead. He looks up. Everywhere he looks, he's reminded of his sin. 
Those are his last words as he's reciting the Psalms of repentance. And someone might hear that and say, well, that sounds ridiculously morbid. Why, why would you want those to be your last words? Well, because Augustine knew something. If he saw his sin, he would see his Savior. If he saw his sin, it would open up his heart to, to see his Savior. And this is when he cries out, oh, happy sin. Oh, happy sin. I have sinned against the Lord. And because I've sinned against him and I've confessed it to him, he does what he does best. He saves me. He saves me. He forgives me. He redeems me. And so now he's restored to me the joy of my salvation because I've let it go. I've confessed it. Oh, happy sin. See, confessing our sins isn't about beating ourselves up. Listen to me, confessing your sin is not synonymous with self-hatred. It's not. That, that's not what sin is about. Sometimes we prefer that, that people wallow in their sin. You know, we, we want people to just feel bad about it, feel terrible about it, beat yourself up. It's not real confession unless you're like weeping and gnashing of teeth, especially when it's someone else who sinned against us, Right? I mean, we want them to feel the pain that they've caused to us. We want them to prove to us that they really mean it this time, that they're really confessing and they're really changing. We want them to prove to us, but that's not biblical confession. Biblical confession is not about proving yourself to God or proving yourself to anyone else. In fact, confession in the Bible isn't about using a lot of words or using lofty words. David uses two words here. Biblical confession is not about intensity. It's about honesty. It's about honesty. You're coming before God honest to say, this is who I am. This is what I've done. And I've done it against you, Lord. And I've done it against these other people. I have sinned. I have sinned against the Lord. This is what it means to confess. In other words, sinning, uh, uh, sin is never to be minimized, right? It's never to be minimized and, and to put aside, but it's also never to be made the main event. It's not, it's not the greatest thing about us. It's not the greatest thing happening in your life. There was an old preacher who once said wisely, he said this, for every one look you take at your sin, take 10 looks at your Savior. For every one look you take at your sin, take 10 looks at your Savior. Why? Because your sin isn't the main event. It's not the main event. I mean, sin can be wrongly ignored, and that's why we're talking about confession. But it can be also wrongly idolized. You can make sin the biggest thing in your life, and you can be overwhelmed by it and, and treat it as if this is something impossible for God to handle. But listen, God invites you to confess your sins on your way to rejoicing in his salvation. This is a means to get to him. This is a means for a celebration. This is a means for God to do in you what no one else can do. And so God invites us to repent of our sins on our way to rejoicing. We rejoice in the God who forgives. We rejoice in the God who removes our sin. As far as the east is from the west, we rejoice in the God who, who shows mercy to a thousand generations. We rejoice in a God who washes us thoroughly from all our transgression and sin. Sin isn't that amazing. Grace is what's amazing. That that's the point of the confession. The confession is not to sit in the sin, it's to get past the sin to the God who saves. And so where does the Lord need to restore to you the joy of your salvation? I mean, ask yourself that today. Where, where does God need to restore to you the joy of your salvation? Confe confession is the invitation of God to do just that. Right? It's, it's the invitation of God to breathe to exhale what is wicked in your life, what is sinful in your life, and to inhale his goodness and grace and mercy and transforming power. It's to confess and to believe. Right? And some of you to, uh, this morning, you, you might be struggling with uh, holding on to things that you feel like, if I can just hide my way into joy, maybe I don't have to confess it. I can hide my way back into a, a joyful life. I can hide my way back into a relationship with God. But listen, it'll never work. But some of you are also here this morning who, who instead of confessing your sins, you've waited and waited and waited because you feel like you need some kind of elaborate confession. You know, you need something that's poetry worthy 
Or, or you need to come down to the front and lay out and cry and weep and, and do all that. But, and nothing wrong with any of those things. You can write a poem, you can weep, you can cry. But it's not required. Confession is simply, I, I want to be honest with God. This, this is who I am. This is what I've done. And God, I take it to you. I lay it before you. And it's when you do that, you're able to say, oh, happy sin. This, this has led me to my Savior. I have, I have now experienced the grace and mercy of God in ways I could never myself if I didn't confess, if I didn't believe in what he says. But this joy of forgiveness and freedom from sin, it, it isn't free. In fact, it requires death. And this is the last thing, point three, deadly sin. Look at verse 13 and 14. It goes on to say this, Nathan said to David, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. In other words, David was right. Remember, David hears the story and his first response is, that man deserves to die. You're right, David. In fact, all of us in our sin, there, there is a, a deserving of death. There's a deserving of a penalty. There's a deserving of a consequence. And Paul in the New Testament would summarize it in Romans chapter 6. He would say the wages of sin is death. Right? In other words, what Paul is saying is there is a penalty. There is a price that all of us have to pay in our sin. God can't just forget about your sin. He can't just sweep it under the rug and say, let's pretend like it didn't happen. No, justice requires a payment. It requires a payment. Listen, this is why all of us struggle to forgive, right? Because we know that instinctively. instinctively. We know that if someone has wronged us and we are called to forgive them, it's going to cost us something. It means that I have to absorb the cost of what that person has done to me. They've, they've hurt me, they've harmed me, they, they've wronged me in some way, and now rather than forcing them to pay for it, I have to absorb that payment myself if I forgive them. That, that's what it means. And it's the same thing with God. God knows that in order for him to be a just God, in order for him to hold up the justice system of the universe, someone has to pay for sin. Someone has to pay. Forgiveness is never free. Someone always pays for it. And so here, Nathan tells David the tragic gospel, if you want to call it that. He tells David, you aren't going to die, but your son to be born he will die. David, you are the one who's guilty. You are the one who deserves to die. But the one who is innocent and doesn't deserve to die, he's going to die in your place. I mean, can you imagine the tragedy? Can you imagine the immensity of gratitude for the rest of David's life? I mean, David, every minute, every moment, every hour, every month, every year, I guarantee you, he's thinking about his son who died in his place. The only reason David is able to continue in the story, the only reason he's able to live is because his son died in his place so that he wouldn't die. This is the tragic gospel that life only comes through the death of a substitute. It only comes through the death of a substitute. And this story right here points towards the promise of David's greater son, the ultimate son of David, Jesus Christ, who would come and he would die for the sins of the whole world. He would die as our substitute. John Stott says it this way. He says, The essence of sin is man substituting himself for God, while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for for man. See, in sin, we've tried to become God. We've tried to play God and, and live his life for him, and we fail. But in salvation, God has actually become one of us, and he succeeded. He succeeded at being us. God in Christ took on human flesh to live the life that we're called to live, and he lived it in perfect obedience all of his life. But then in his death, he took on human sin so that he could die in the place of sinners, die for the death that we deserve. So the wages of your, of your past sins were passed on to him. The wages of your present sin are present in his crucified body. The wages of your future sin were fully satisfied on the cross as he hung in our place. If Jesus doesn't take our place, then we have no promise of salvation. The salvation of sinners requires the substitute of a Savior. That's the requirement. 
1967, uh, the world heard reports from South Africa of the first successful human heart transplant in the world. The patient was a man named Lewis who was 53 years old. He was terminally ill with heart failure, and the donor was a 25-year-old woman named Denise who had been in a fatal car accident, and when she was uh, pronounced dead, they decided quickly that this was their one chance to have a donor that matched uh, Lewis and, and his needs. And so uh, they quickly set up the operating rooms. They had two rooms. In the one room, they had Denise, who was uh, being prepared for the surgery to transplant her heart into Lewis. And the doctor, his name was Chris Bernard, who would do this historic operation. He is in the room waiting on the heart that's coming into the room with Lewis. And as they transfer the heart into the operating room, he says, I took hold of the heart and I leaned over Lewis's body. And for the first time in my life, I saw a hole in a human chest of a man who was living. He said, it was at that moment that I realized that what this was going to cost would be everything. It cost her everything. In other words, he's saying for me to save his life and to give him this transplant, it cost her her life. It would require a substitute. It re would require one life for another. Saving his life required her life on the line. Oh, happy sin. Christ has died. Christ has died that we might live. Christ has died that we might know our Savior. Christ has died that we might see our sin and be moved to the one who saves. Will you come to him today? To the one who's taken your place, who's been your substitute. He stands in our place as our substitute, in the God of our salvation, in the place of humanity. He stands eager to forgive. He stands eager to transform. He stands eager to receive us in. He says this, Confess your sins, and there's a promise of life on the other side. The one who has taken our place will forgive because he's done everything to pay for it. Let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, our great substitute, our Savior who loves us beyond anything we can imagine. Oh, Lord, we're filled with gratitude that You've given and given and given, and yet despite our sin and, and failures, you continue to give. You continue to provide, providing even your own life in our place. Oh, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would open our eyes to see our sin, and we, may we not wallow in it, may we not sit in despair, but may we confess it and find the joy of confession, the joy of being restored in our salvation. Oh, Lord, may you do it for your glory and our good. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand to our feet this morning. Uh, and as we sing this last song, I want to invite our prayer team forward. There will be prayer team members at the front and in the back. Uh, if you have anything you'd like us to pray for, maybe it's something on your heart this morning that you came in uh, burdened about, or maybe it's something that was spoken in the message that spoke to you, or even if it's something like you, you want to start a relationship with God. You want to have a relationship with God and you're not sure how to do that, you want someone to talk with you and pray with you, uh, our team would be up here ready and excited to do that for you. And so let's pray as we sing this last song. Jesus is broken and 
because he has never lost a battle. Who are you, great mountain, that you should not bow low? Jesus defeated the darkness, he has never lost a battle. dismiss a few reminders if you didn't get a chance to fill out a connect card we would love to pray with you connect with you you can drop that in the back or uh, you can drop it with our hospitality team on the way out uh, we would love to to connect with you also march uh, march 3rd so i get get the date right march 3rd is our next welcome party we uh, didn't announce that earlier but if you've been around for a little while and you want to get connected and meet our staff and learn about our church march 3rd right after church is always the first sunday of the month so you can uh, come and, and join us in that we would love to have you 
Now, if your faith is in Christ, hear his benediction as he sends us out with his grace and favor in this God who's never lost a battle, but always wins for saving sinners like us. He has been our substitute. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he turn his face towards you and give you his peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. Go in his peace. Love you all.